This is the newsroom for today, Wednesday, February 10, 2021. We're broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN, and Tarsi TV in Bartica. In the headlines, relatives recover the bodies of their loved ones following the backtrack route tragedy on the Quarantine River. So we started since last night or so. Can we go this morning? And someone called that they found a woman. And when we go, we see that it's my mommy cousin. Guyana is set to immunize 1,400 healthcare workers on Thursday following the donation of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines from Barbados. Former Army Chief Gary Best is freed of a drunk driving charge in the Jude Bentley fatal accident case. In tonight's features, we present the story of a patriotic Guyanese who turned her teenage passion into a lifelong profession and a fire service sub-officer who survived COVID-19. And in sport, Pirmal could play second test as West Indies looked to close out series and national footballer lands scholarship at Chicago State University. With the news, I'm Avana Ashramzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that relatives on Wednesday morning recovered the bodies of Alwyn Joseph and 77-year-old Baboni Harihar, known as Doris of Percy Smith Street, Palmyra, East Barbies, Quarantine, who went missing after they entered Ghana via the backtrack route from Suriname on Tuesday. Still missing is 48-year-old Sharida Hussein. The trio was on their way back to Guyana from Suriname via the backtrack route in a speedboat when they informed relatives that they were dropped off in waist-deep water on the sandbank in the dark on Tuesday night. Joseph's body was discovered in the vicinity of Number 64 shore at around 6 hours 25 by relatives who were part of a continued search party. His relatives, Yogeshwar Lekraj and Naraini Sham Sundar, spoke with the media on Wednesday. This morning we went for a search because after he began missing us so we started since last night or so then we go this morning and someone called that they found a woman and when we go we see that it's my mommy cousin and then like two minutes after the police reached me and that's it six day on the shore beach and the body was face down you said you grew up with him. You uh, all you guys grew up as but like almost like brothers and sisters. Sister, yes. Tell me about the type of person Alwyn was. Alwyn was a good boy. He's a friendly boy, and then he um majority time sometimes is when it is come over a little bit more smart and like Kerry. He's lived by me. We've been living sixty nine. He has lived by me long, and um majority times like when he lived by me me hardly just got to cook on some majority time he just took all the cooking and everything for me just helped me a lot he was a good good boy helped me over my meanwhile harihar's remains were discovered on the number 69 village foreshore at around 8 hours 25 by a fisherman who was setting his seine in the vicinity when he noticed a handbag on the beach upon further investigation he found the body of the elderly woman among mangrove roots on the foreshore the fisherman quickly ran from the area and made contact with the police. The body was escorted to the Antony's funeral parlor, where Nadira Valdez positively identified the remains as that of her beloved grandmother. Guyana's border with Suriname has been closed since March 2020 in an effort to curb the spread of the deadly coronavirus. As a result, many persons have been using the backtrack route to conduct business. The Ministry of Health is set to begin its COVID-19 vaccination rollout on Thursday with the donation of some 3,000 of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines from Barbados. This first trance will be administered to frontline healthcare workers and according to the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, it is not mandatory to take the vaccine. Isanella Patwa reports. The vaccines arrived in Guyana on Wednesday on a regional security system chartered flight at the Eugene Correa International Airport at Ogle on the east coast of Demerara. Barbados and Dominica are among the first set of Caribbean countries to receive its COVID-19 vaccines. Barbados received 100,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines on Tuesday from India and donated 3,000 doses to Guyana. These vaccines will be administered to 1,500 persons, the majority of whom will be frontline health workers, while 100 persons will be vaccinated at the CARICOM Secretariat. The vaccines are to be administered twice to one person, with the second dose to be given 4 to 12 weeks after the first. Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony expressed thanks to the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, for the donation. And out of that donation, the Prime Minister has decided uh, to give us uh, a number of doses, 3,000 doses, uh, which would be used uh, for our frontline workers here. 
So we are extremely grateful, and as you can see, we just received uh, these doses. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization, WHO, is expected to officially list the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine as an emergency on Thursday. Um, the expert committee on vaccines uh, met yesterday and have greenlighted the AstraZeneca vaccine. So WHO is going to put it as one of the vaccines uh, on the emergency use listing, and that would happen tomorrow. As a head of the frontline health workers, will you be receiving um, the vaccine in this case? Well, I'm not uh, really, really at the front line. Um, so I would prefer that the persons who are interacting with patients and so forth, that they get the vaccines first because they are more at risk and later on I, I would take the vaccine. Can you say where uh, the drive will begin first, uh, whether Region 4 or... Yes, we would um, tomorrow. Uh, we will have an exercise. Uh, we will get uh, the persons from the Georgetown Hospital and those in charge of the, um, the, the Ocean View facility. So we'll start with, with those persons because they are really the ones who interact more often with patients. Will these uh, health workers be given a choice though if they have to? Oh, of course, them? yes. Okay. If they don't want it, that's fine. But uh, we want to make sure that they have an option to get it. President of Guyana, Dr. Irfan Ali, in a statement on Wednesday stated that in the coming days and weeks, Ghana will receive vaccines from India, China, COVAX and the CARICOM African Union Agreement. The president assured that the government's top priority is to have every Guyanese vaccinated before the end of the year. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isana Lopato. And an 82-year-old woman died at her Region 10, that's the Upper Demerara Burby's house, on Tuesday from COVID-19. The Ministry of Health noted that a swab test was done on the elderly woman after her body arrived at a medical facility. This latest death takes Ghana's overall death toll since recording its first case in March 2020 to 182. She is also the fifth person to die from the disease for the month of February. Now, police have arrested a man who attacked an attempt to sexually assault a female employee of the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation on Saturday last. Newsroom understands that a victim had just relieved another staff member in the switchboard room and forgot to lock the door when the young perpetrator entered from off the streets armed with a scissors. He locked the door, took off his clothes and ordered the woman to take off hers as well. Reports indicate that the woman started to scream and one of the public security officers who was nearby overheard and rushed to the room. The security officer contacted his colleague at the main gate who was successful in arresting the perpetrator. During the ordeal, the woman received two cuts, one to her chin and another on the arm. The victim returned to work two days later but was still traumatized over the incident and so she was given a further seven days off work to recuperate. Newsroom understands that she is also receiving support from one of the hospital's social workers. Former Army Chief Gary Best is freed of a drunk driving charge in the Jude Bentley fatal accident case and the government is making legislative changes to guard against electoral fraud. Those and more when the newsroom returns. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. City Magistrate Clive Nurse on Wednesday upheld a no-case submission by Defence Attorney Nigel Hughes and dismissed the charge of driving under the influence against the former Army Chief Rear Admiral retired Gary Best. It was only two months ago that Best was freed of the charge of causing the death of national cyclist Jude Bentley. Hughes asked the court to dismiss the driving on the influence charge on the grounds that the prosecution failed to produce sufficient evidence to prove key elements of the case. Hughes also relied on the testimony of a police officer who, during the trial, told the court that the results of the breathalyzer test are considered unreliable if the machine is not calibrated every six months. In his ruling on Wednesday, magistrate nurse agreed that the prosecution failed to prove the elements of the offence and noted that there was no evidence to prove that the breathalyzer test was approved for usage. Best had pleaded not guilty to the charge, which alleged that on February 8, 2020, at Clive Lloyd Drive, Georgetown, he drove motor vehicle PRR 8182 while his blood alcohol level was 0.85 micrograms. He was granted self-bail on that charge. Bentley, 41, was a businessman and national cyclist, and he was riding along the highway as part of his training when he was struck down in the vicinity of the Russian embassy at approximately five hours by a black Land Cruiser driven by Best. Best was arrested at the scene and two breathalyzer tests were administered, which revealed that he was way above the legally prescribed alcohol limit. 
The Civil Defense Commission, that's the CDC, is in contact with experts from the University of the West Indies to provide assistance to Guyana in monitoring and assessing seismic activities that have been ongoing in the deep south Rupununi Region 9. Director General of the CDC, Lieutenant Colonel Kester Craig, told Newsroom that while Guyana is not exempt from earthquake aftershocks, it does not have the local capacity to conduct monitoring. Isanella Patwa reports. The Civil Defense Commission, CDC, is engaged in experts from the University of the West Indies Seismic Research Center on the way forward following earthquake aftershocks being experienced in the deep south Rupununi. The Director General of the CDC, Lieutenant Colonel Kester Craig, explained that the earthquake which rocked three villages in the deep south a week ago was a very rare occurrence and the likelihood of another earthquake with such a magnitude occurring is one in 100 years. It's because this is a hazard that occurred at that magnitude for the first time in Guyana. And then the uh, continuous uh, aftershocks, which are usually normal after any earthquake impact. So the residents um, develop some amount of fear, not knowing what to expect. Um, but from what the, the technical persons are saying, these events uh, are very rare. Uh, I want you to have like, a major impact is what we have experienced. Um, the likelihood of one of that uh, happening in a very short period is not, is not high. The Director General further revealed that Guyana does not have the capacity to monitor these activities. So the capacity to assess is one thing <clears throat> which um, we can assess. But when it comes to monitoring, which is another aspect of it, um, it calls for um, insulation of the seismograph at various locations and also calls for other technical um, instruments and, and support. Um, in that regard, I don't think we have the, the necessary resources. A number of houses and a school in three villages, Katunarib, Aishaltan and Sarari Row, were impacted as a result of the earthquake and the CDC continues to assess the damages. The Director General further revealed that they will be approaching the Ministry of Public Works to construct sturdier houses in the area. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Pato. Now, as government works out the modalities for the setting up of a commission of inquiry into the March 2, 2020 elections, it is also looking to draft amendments to strengthen the country's existing electoral laws. Once those amendments are passed, Vice President Bar Jagdeo says the country's electoral body must also rid itself of corrupt officials to allow for free and fair elections. Kurt Campbell reports. Vice President Dr. Barajak Dio on Tuesday said that while the government has not gone ahead with setting up its promised Commission of Inquiry to investigate the March 2, 2020 general and regional elections, it will soon take steps to amend existing laws to ensure that there are safeguards and penalties against electoral fraud. He envisions that the amendments will allow for the statements of polls to be published in the newspapers, official gazette and online before the count commences. And Jack Dio noted that the amendments that will be drafted soon will also clearly outline penalties for electoral fraud and how recounts must be conducted. At this point in time, we are looking at the Representation of People Act and we are drafting now the amendments to that act, or we will be drafting shortly, amendments to the act that will ensure transparency in the count um, and clear a clear methodology as to how the count must proceed, leaving no ambiguity. So for example, uh, the statements of poll, when they are received, before the count starts, we want them published. We want them published in the newspapers, in the Gazette, and posted online. So even before the count starts, the industrious Guyanese can then go see the SOPs and they can calculate who, who won the elections. 
But even with these legislative changes, Jagdia believes that the Guyan Elections Commission, GCOM, must remove from within its staff those persons who are currently before the courts on charges of being involved in attempts to rig the 2020 elections. He singled out the Chief Elections Officer, Keith Lowenfield, and his deputy, Roxanne Myers. But we have made it clear, apart from those changes, that with Lowenfield and Roxanne Myers there, you cannot have free and fair elections. Cannot have free and fair elections. This is a, a, a red line for us. That the two of them, you cannot have free and fair elections. They have demonstrated every single external group and people locally know they try to steal the elections. Jagdio said the government is currently looking for persons from abroad to sit on the COI, but he fears that if the report from the COI is adverse against the APNU AFC coalition, then their leaders might simply disregard it by leveling claims of bribery against the government, as was done during the 2020 elections. Notwithstanding, the vice president said the government was definitely going ahead with the COI. The governing People's Progressive Party Civic has always maintained that several persons within GCOM, including Lowenfield Myers and the Region 4 returning officer Clement Mingo, colluded to rig the elections to keep the APNU AFC in office. That led to a five-month-long delay in declaring the winner while political parties frequented the courts and were later involved in a national recount exercise. Lowenfield came under scrutiny for preparing his elections report on March 5, 2020, which included inflated figures presented to him by Mingo. If Mingo's report was used, the country would have been cheated of the real victors of the elections, and instead David Granger and his coalition would have been sworn in for a second term. Lowenfield and Myers would have known who the true winners of the elections was since they received the original statements of polls from all of the country's polling stations. Still ahead on the newsroom, NAPS sees a spike in sexually transmitted infections and the Agriculture Ministry is monitoring the sharp increase in the price of vegetables. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. The National AIDS Program Secretariat, NAPS, intends to roll out its annual couple's HIV testing drive for Valentine's Day this year, but with an added feature. That new feature will see screening for several other sexually transmitted infections. Kurt Campbell reports. While Guyana has been able to reduce the number of new HIV infections, the National AIDS Program Secretariat, NAPS, says its records show a spike in other sexually transmitted infections, STI, with syphilis being in the lead. As a consequence, this year's HIV couples testing drive will also see persons being screened for sexually transmitted infections such as syphilis and hepatitis B. The ramped-up testing activities will commence on Friday, February 12 and will run until Sunday, February 14. Teams from NAPS will be at the Starbrook Market on Friday while persons can get access to the service on Saturday at the City Mall, Camp and Regent Street, the Monrepo Market on the east coast of Demerara and Gifland Mall. On Sunday, the team will be at the Perica Market on the east bank of Essequibo and the Kitty Sea Wall in Georgetown. Persons can also access the service at the standard testing sites across the country. As Voluntary Counseling and Testing VCT Coordinator Deborah Success Hall explains, the activity is mainly to allow couples to be tested as a demonstration of their love and commitment to each other. And this activity is where it actually was an initiative from Dr. Shanti Singh, who was our pro former program manager. When we examine our programmatic data, we recognize that in everything we do, we did, more females were accessing the service. And so we came up with an activity that will involve men. And so that was the birth of the Valentine's Day couple testing, where you see couples getting tested together as a demonstration of their love and commitment to each other. But now NAPS has a new challenge on its hand, and that is to address the spike in STI cases. STI coordinator Dr. Keisha Chin said it is in this vein that her department decided to collaborate with the VCT department to roll out the 2021 activity. What we have noted here at the National AIDS Program Secretariat is that it's very important to provide um, a comprehensive package of services to our population, not only to the wider general population, but also to our key populations and vulnerable groups. So what we will be doing on my part for STI is that we um, would have 
collaborated with the Kong, with the voluntary Kong Sun testing um, section within NAPS to provide STI screening for not only couples but anyone that would be interested on the days that we will be um, executing our activities. Um, mainly the screening that we will be doing based on the te test kits that we have available, we'll be screening for syphilis and also for hepatitis B as well on that day. Persons who test positive will be referred to a medical facility to receive treatment and counseling. Dr. Chain assured that privacy is utmost during the three-day activity. NAP said it managed to test some 23,000 persons countrywide, a shortfall in its annual testing numbers because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister of Agriculture, Zulfikar Mustafa, says the government is monitoring the increase in vegetable prices and that assistance has been rendered to farmers by his ministry to help remedy the situation. Sheena Henry reports. Speaking on the sidelines of an event on Tuesday, Minister Zulfikar Mustafa said the ministry has been analyzing the ongoing situation, which has resulted in increased prices for vegetables in regions 4 and 6. So what we have done, I asked, I asked our people them to do an analysis around the country. We have um, noticed that the in, um, we have had, um, some items or some vegetable price, we have had a steep increase and this came about because of the uh, heavy rainfall that we have experienced. A number of farmers were flooded out. He explained that the Agriculture Ministry is working with farmers to help cover their expenses while aiding them with planting materials in the hope of returning the situation to some semblance of normalcy. But at the same time we have given back a number of farmers um, some, some help in terms as, as a matter of fact, you know for a fact that we sent things in the Pameroon only last week from Saturday. And we are working with the farmers to see how they could um, cover these costs. As a matter of fact, we are giving back planting materials, pesticides and fertilizers and so, so that they can go back into farming. This will be, I hope, is a very temporary period this will last for, and we'll get back to normalcy shortly. And I think that um, now farmers are get, getting this kind of help from the ministry and they will put that back, go back to the uh, farm. The minister explained that the increase in the cost of vegetables is as a result of excessive rainfall. He expressed confidence that normalcy will soon return. But I think because of the heavy rainfall we would have, we we had for the past few weeks, and the flooded condition that we have experienced, many farmers will have lost their crop, and as a result of that, we have the few that will remain, we have seen a steep increase of these prices. As I said, I am very optimistic that the price will return back to normal, and we are trying to help these farmers to go back to the land to continue their planting. And I am hoping that within a week that we can go back to the normal see in terms of getting back to the normal prices of these things. For the newsroom, I'm Sheena Henry. Now, one week ago, the village of Ramadong in Upper Masaruni Region 7 recorded a spike in positive COVID-19 cases. But this week, the Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, is reporting that residents in neighboring villages are putting up a strong resistance and are refusing to get tested for the dreaded virus. While the cases in Ramadong are all asymptomatic, the health minister said it is important for the authorities to get a sense of the situation in the nearby villages. The Ministry of Health remains in talks with the village leaders and is hoping for a positive outcome. Well, right now we have 47 active cases in Waramadong. And as I've said before, uh, we have been working with other villages in the Upper Mass to, um, to get a sense of whether they have um, cases or not. In, in some of the villages, we have received the cooperation of the village and we have been able to take samples and so forth. But in others, there have been very strong resistance. And um, we hope that uh, the village leaders and so forth would reconsider because we are all doing this to ensure the safety. Uh, first of all, to understand whether they have active cases and if they do, uh, to get them to take the right measures so that they can protect themselves and the, and the village population. So we're, we're still in talks with some of those villages that are a little bit resistant and, and hopefully uh, we can change that outcome. We have done a lot of sensitization um, in that area, uh, explaining to them the the disease, how it's caused, how it's transmitted, what are the precautions you need to take and so forth. And hopefully we'll get uh, more cooperation. When the newsroom returns, we present the story of a patriotic Guyanese who turned her teenage passion into a lifelong profession and a fire service sub-officer who survived COVID-19. This is the newsroom. 
Guyana recorded its first COVID-19 case and death in March 2020. Since then, the country has recorded 182 deaths and over 8,000 positive cases. Notably, there have been 7,026 recoveries as of February 9. Danica Paul shares the story of one survivor who is back on his job doing what he loves. Nigel Gerslandi has been employed at the Guyana Fire Service for the past 21 years and holds the rank of a sub-officer. The 39-year-old of Lamaha Spring is a COVID-19 survivor. The father of two decided to take the test after experiencing severe symptoms last October. I can recall it was the 19th of October. Um, I had a meeting. So I attended the meeting and, um, you know, with the usual COVID um, requirements, mask and so forth. Later on that evening when I re um, returned home, I wasn't feeling well. I, you know, kind of felt a bit unwell. Flu-like symptoms came on. It's like, okay, it's just a normal flu. Then the fever, you know, started to take over me. The next day, I was still having this fever, so I started to boil up this concussion, you know, the uh, conventional medicine that the people usually say would work, like the ginger, the onion, fever grass, and all of these conventional medicine. And I used that for approximately almost a week. The fever and so on was still there, still feeling and when I was like, you know what? This is more than just a flu. I think I need to go and get tested. At that time I was at my lowest. So I didn't even think I would have returned home. So when I got to the hospital, um, I was then admitted to the ICU and I could not have even climbed the stairs. They had to literally heist me up those stairs to the ICU and it was an emotional wreck after them. I was at the ICU at Georgetown Public Hospital. <laughs> I did have online issues because um, I was asthma I am asthmatic and also hypertensive. So coupled with COVID, I think you know that was one of the uh, problem with having online issues. Because when you contract pneumonia, pneumonia is not something that you overcome just like that. It takes approximately sometimes six months. And it all depends on the immune system and how well you build your body with your um, supplements and so forth. <music> Nevertheless, my lung was not 100%, so, you know, I took, you know, every precaution, every care. Having COVID can really affect you mentally if you're not strong because, um, it kind of mess with your your mind you have you, you get you get into a state of confusion you know um, I had problems thinking clear my thoughts were were confused you know it was it was affecting me mentally you know you have to be very strong mentally to overcome COVID especially if you were placed in ICU where you have persons dying next to you. Many nights I go to bed and you get up, somebody die. You know, yes, there's a bit of fear that would come on you, but you know, you still have to reassure yourself that I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it. I have to make it. I gotta make it for my family. And you work towards that, ensuring that you take your medication, do everything that the health professionals would have advised you to do. Um, you do your exercise. And, you know, most of all, 
you have to work on your on your mental status because that's the only thing that can preserve you. Role model, mentor, problem solver, nation builder, call them what you may. Teachers are indispensable in any society. They play a significant role in molding future generations and their teachings more often than not have a lasting impression. Tonight we present the story of a patriotic Guyanese who turned her teenage passion into a lifelong profession shaping lives and careers over the last five decades. On February 10, 1971, an ambitious young lady from the East Coast Demerara community of Covenjohn opted to embark in a career in teaching. 50 years on, she has become an icon, a stalwart and a well-respected educator. Through her commitment, dedication and perseverance, thousands have been molded into productive members of society. Outside of the classroom, this outstanding Guyanese has served in many roles. Currently, she is a member of the Ethnic Relations Commission and the Rights of the Child Commission. I am Rajkumari Singh, Principal of Hindu College, and I serve in a number of positions. Um, one of it in the education field, I'm Master Trainer on the education program that is managed by NSERD. So I assist in training educators and administrators in various schools, primary and secondary schools, to become better educators. as a young girl, 16 years at Ramakrishna Primary School, building then owned by the Dharmic Sabha, but the school was governed by the government. And um, I always wanted to be a teacher. I attended Hindu College as a student, and the school just behind it is the Hindu Primary School. So my entire uh, primary and secondary education was done in this compound. And then I moved off to after teaching at Ramakrishna School, I moved to Government Training College then, and then I moved to university. And I came back to teach in the Hindu Primary School, that was then a Hindu Primary School, now it is Swami Purnananda Primary School, and then come back here to teach at Hindu College and moved up the ladder to principal. At the beginning, I just applied for a job. And after teacher's training college, I was sent by the Ministry of, of Education to the school I taught, uh, I was attending. So I sometimes feel it is divine intervention. And the reason why I wanted to teach here is because this, the monks and the monks in training, the Brahmacharis and the Swamis, were teaching in this school. And I always want to emulate them. And I learned as a little girl from the founder of this institution, Swami Purnanandaji Maharaj, who is no longer here, a monk that came from India, that when he came here to serve Guyana, a monk from India, he recognized that the greatest gift he could have given to the Guyanese was education. And he started this Hindu college and this Hindu primary school. And so it was that desire in me having seen what the monks would have done, that I wanted to continue in the same path, to educate people. Because when you educate persons, and in the terms of education I'm talking here, it's not just academically, but morally and spiritually, giving them the right values to go out into the world of work. And so they can become the change in society, they can carry on the mentorship, they can carry on the leadership, and we can sit back and be proud to say, yes, our children are doing this. The second thing that, one, that made me want to stay here as well is that I've learned also that the greatest service, one another greatest service that you can do is to serve your own country. And so while there were opportunities for me to move to other countries like my batchmates and my other colleagues, I never left. I was never lured by the term of greener pastures or more money and I stayed on and I never left the country to work anywhere else and that I'm so proud of today. To say that there were no challenges would certainly not be the truth. Um, one of the 
challenges I have, and I still have it to some extent, is the challenge of getting students to be self-disciplined. So the discipline that the institution taught me that I am putting out is to allow children to have that change in behavior so that whatever happens in life, they can cope with it. Once the children become self-disciplined, then academic is easy because they can go on with their duties. And that has been one of my greatest challenges. And also for parents to understand that they have to encourage the children to have that discipline. Of course everyone needs money, but the greatest reward of teaching would not only be the financial gains, but it will be the satisfaction, the deep, deep satisfaction that you would have made, that one would have made to change someone's life. And when we see persons, and I'm not talking for myself here, but all the other teachers all over this country and all throughout the world would have seen the changes in their students and the way they, they conduct themselves in their workplace and the kind of not just economical, um, economically benefited but however they are, the values they put out and the values they put to their children because at this point I'm even teaching the children's children that I would have right. thought. The, the kind of behavior, the kind of persons they become, the kind of human beings they become, that's a deep, deep satisfaction. That was most challenging, I can say that. Um, of course, it was a shock at first, but then as we got into it, it taught us to be more innovative, to become wiser in using technology, and to realize that we could meet the students. At that time, we couldn't meet some of them face to face, now we can. But we could have made, been able to meet them in their homes, and we could have been able to help to motivate them. Of course, it was never 100% as face-to-face, -face, but it did work to some extent. Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a little bit happening in sport. We start things off with some cricket news. Bangladesh bowling attack thrives on the slow and low turning pitches and after the Shatogram pitch did not deteriorate as expected, they will look to Dhaka for more assistance to level the series. While Bangladesh has more than one selection puzzle, West Indies will toy with the idea of including Virsami Pramal as a third outright spin option on the drive surface expected. More from Akim Green. Captain Craig Bratwit speaking on the eve of the second and final test, which starts Wednesday from 20 hours 30 Eastern Caribbean time, indicated Pramal is an option to consider given the surface. You're looking at a pitch, it, it, it will be a thought. Um, you know, for sure, I think Pramal is a you know, quality spinner, you know, very experienced, you know, over the years. So, you know, obviously come tomorrow, you know, that decision will be made. I think the pitch, you know, is it, quite similar to the first test in terms of the dryness. Uh, see a few cracks as well, so I, I think it will be quite similar, but probably a little a little slower even than the than the first test. West Indies only got 259 in their first innings in response to Bangladesh's 430, and it took an historic and unbeaten double century from debutant Kyle Mears in support from another debutant and Kruma Bono to get him over the line in pursuit of 395 in the second innings. But I think uh, our first innings score. You know, we, we could obviously improve on, on that for sure. Uh, obviously, second innings was good. Um, I think in the field, you know, we, we could still be a little sharper, you know, in peers where, you know, things, you know, but guys probably been in a partnership. We could, you know, be, be a little tight and not as flat. But, you know, I think I think the first game was, was decent. Uh, but as I said, I think the first innings total, you know, in terms of the score, you know, could improve, you know, to set up the game a, a little better. Boyd by their first win in the subcontinent since November 2016 when they defeated Pakistan and Sharjah, Bartwitt says they can't get ahead of themselves. There is a tough job ahead. That's obviously the biggest thing, you know, not to get carried away. Um, obviously, happy with the win, but, you know, we got to start back, you know, from zero. And, 
you know, that that's one of the things we obviously caught stress in the last two days at the practice sessions. And, you know, the guys have, have been have been buckled down, you know, buckled down and been working hard. Um, but, you know, for us, it's, it's, I mean, from me to them, it'll just be, you know, to stay disciplined, you know, stick to your plans, both as a bowling unit and as a, as a batting unit, you know, don't, you know, think that you're starting, you know, at, at 100, you know, you got to start from zero. And I think the guys have buckled down. And, you know, the main thing is not to become complacent. You know, we played, you know, a good first test and we got five days of hard test cricket coming up. Two Bangladesh players, Shakib Halasan and Shadman Islam, are both who loaded hip injuries. And Shakib in particular will be missed tremendously, given the balance he brings. And in this case, he is a leading wicket taker, 62 wickets at the venue. Despite West Indies lost their previous test in Dhaka by innings and 184 runs, they currently hold the momentum in the series and the pressure is on the host to draw level. For the newsroom, Akin Green. Close to the home now, Demerar defeated Essequibo by 76 runs in round one of the hand-in-hand -hand insurance on the 19 inter-county 50-over competition at the LBI ground on Wednesday. Opener Matsu Nandu made 53, Usher Deva Balgobin 45 and Mavindra Dindial 27 in Demerara's 162 for 8 in 38 overs. Jason Holder and Wazir Mohammed picked up two wickets each for Essequibo, who responded with 86 all-out in 27.2 overs. Dwayne Dick picked up three for 15 and Nandu and Chetram Balgobin had two each while Sheldon Charles top scored with 25 and Nico Vincent made 12. Round two of the three-team round robin tournament will take place on Friday at the LBI ground with Burbis playing SA Quibble. The final round will take place on Sunday between Damarara and Burbis. After what turned out to be a resounding victory in the end and the, in their opening game, Ghana Jaguars would look to continue with the momentum when they take on Leeward Islands Hurricanes on Friday in Antigua. More in this report. Playing in their first game of the CG Insurance Super 50 Cup on Monday at the coolest cricket ground, Guyana Jaguars emerged with a 56-run win over Barbados Pride in a rain-affected contest. Batting first, Jaguars got a good start of 48, but then slipped to 88 for 5 before recovering to post 235. Shimron Hetmeyer was at his brutal best, smashing 80 off 52 balls, while Romario Shepard scored 58 not out of 52 and Chandapal Hemraj 35. Jason Holder and Ashley Nurse picked up three wickets each for Barbados Pride, who were 91 for 5 in 29.3 overs when rain intervened and forced an end to the game. Pride needed to be at 148 for 5 at that stage. Kevin Sinclair picked up two wickets while there was one each for Shepard, Nayal Smith and Gudikesh Moti. Speaking to CWI Media after the match, the Jaguars captain Leon Johnson said and I quote, We played well today, the bowlers did a good job. Obviously, Hetty and Sheppy brought their international experience for us. 235 is just about par, but the second innings teams have struggled to pass 190 runs, so we were always confident with the total on the board. We just have to take each game as it comes, and it's just about execution on the day. End quote. No doubt the Jaguars would look for the same level or even better execution on Friday against the Hurricanes. The Guyanese are looking for their first regional 50 over title in over a decade and a half. Guyana lost one in 2005 when they defeated Barbados in the KFC Cup final at Borda. Meanwhile, the current West Indies women's players Shakira Selman and Shamilia Connell have joined the CG Insurance Super 50 Cup television and radio commentary teams for the first time as part of a high-quality group of analysts. Selman is part of the live television broadcast for 13 matches at the coolest cricket ground. The other analysts are legendary fast bowler Sir Curtly Ambrose, former West Indies opening batsman and Trinidad and Tobago captain Darren Ganga, and 2012 and 2016 ICC T20 World Cup winner Samuel Badre. There will also be special guest appearance by the legend Courtney Walsh, he's the new head coach of the West Indies women team, and CWI Director of Cricket Jimmy Adams, the former West Indies captain. Cornell will feature within the live radio commentary broadcast to 10 Caribbean radio stations and worldwide on the West Indies Cricket YouTube channel. Football news to end sport this evening. Senior men's national team and food Congress forward Nicholas McCarter has been offered the opportunity to take up a three-year soccer scholarship at Chicago State University thanks to the intervention of the Alex Bunbury Sports and Academics Academy. More in this report. Well, first and foremost, I, I want to take this moment to thank... Uh the GFF and and football in general. I think this is a big win for football, Guyanese football. And of course, I want to thank the Honorable Minister of Sports uh, for his presence here this, this afternoon. It's uh, always a pleasure to have someone of his stature, to have his support, 
to see that he is a, a lover and a believer in sports, in football in particular. And for me and, and APSA, um, we are proud to be a part of this. This is a great moment for Guyanese football. It's a great moment for us to use this as an inspiration for so many young players here in this beautiful country. So without any further ado, I just think that this is an opportunity that this young man who I've seen a few times now, that I believe has all of the credentials, all of the talent to showcase his God-given ability in an on an international stage, playing and representing Guyana at the first division in U.S. soccer, collegiately. What a special moment that's going to be. And I'm sure his family, his colleagues, and the country in general will be really proud of this young man. First of all, it's a very great pleasure to be able to support this initiative. Um, I, I met Alex uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he explained to me what this was about. And our ministry is maniacally focused on the development of talent and the showcasing of talent. I know more than most, and there are many people who would tell you who've had tremendous success in their own life, how important opportunities are. It's very important, first of all, that you recognize opportunities as opportunities. And then the second is, obviously, is to seize those as opportunities. Uh, I'm very pleased to open doors and support initiatives that create opportunities for Guyanese. I'm particularly pleased as well to do that for young Guyanese. I think um, we have at this moment almost five players that have been developed locally attending colleges within the United States of America. Nicholas MacArthur, who has been blessed, quoting from the minister, to be awarded this opportunity, is going to be joining the likes of Curtis Kelman, Jeremy Garrett, Chanelli, Shamika Marcos, and I think the last young lady we have at Graceland University, Natalie Ned. And these are all young players that before those opportunities were presented to them, they were like any other one, any other player here in Guyana. But what they had that set them apart from their other colleagues was a deep commitment to, developing as, to, to their development as footballers. And Nico has been an example of a young player who has dedicated himself to the craft, to his craft. He has been an outstanding player from the, the time he started as a, as, 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 a, as a peewee player all the way up to where he is. Only recently he was part of that historic under-20 team that participated in the CONCACAF Championship that did so well. One of the best performances that we've had regionally at the under-20 level. This is um, a stepping stone for me um, to go out to the Guyana to play football. That's not only football, that's to study my academics, make my family proud, the Federation proud, Guyana proud. Um, this is something that I has always dream about, to leave this country. Um, I had an opportunity before I get this one here, but things didn't put in place for me because of the finance and, and certain things I couldn't get. So I would just like to thank Alex Bumbry again to getting this opportunity and I would make everybody proud. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page and Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.